Just a quick look of a 2 meter direct conversion receiver that I'm playing around with. Hopefully it will eventually become a transceiver. This is the first 2 meter direct conversion receiver I've ever built and it's presented some challenges that are much easier to overcome with HF direct conversion receivers. Now just a quick run through the stages of this as yet unfinished project. On the left here is the VXO with the large variable capacitor. There's one crystal which for now is 24 megahertz. Exactly 24 megahertz. If you have a low capacitance in series with it, you can actually get a little bit above 24 megahertz, which puts it just inside of the two motor band. In this case, I can get it about one kilohertz above 24 megahertz, which puts you around 144.006. An advantage of 24 megahertz as opposed to lower frequencies is you don't need to multiply it up so much. With fewer multipliers the circuitry is simple, there are fewer tuned circuits and importantly fewer spurious signals to put out. The oscillator itself has its tank circuit tuned to its third harmonic of 72 megahertz. By doing that that reduces the amount of multiplication you need for later stages. Because of the risk of microphonics, indirect conversion receivers, I'm not directly connecting the shaft of the tuning capacitor to the vernier drive. Instead, I'm using a flexible coupler. Of course, these days it's not very cost effective if you have to get a crystal made up. That might cost you $50, whereas a DDS kit like this might cost not much more than that. Still, I've opted to go for the VXO because it uses much less current and there's a certain elegance about the simplicity of a one transistor RF oscillator. If I ordered the crystal to multiply up to 144.22 to provide a little bit of leeway then I should be able to pull that down to at least 144.2 and probably 144.15. The VXO is at the heart of the success of this project although I'm not using it for today's tests because it only covers a small section above 144 MHz and not the beacon frequencies that we want to try. For that reason I'm bypassing the VXO and instead using an N3ZI DDS. That's set to 24 MHz but it's frequency agile so I can tune all frequencies on the 2 motor band plus a lot either side. The output from the DDS goes through the coax cable you see here straight into the frequency doubler. Our next stage is the frequency doubler which doubles the frequency from 72 to 144 MHz. That uses a 2N2369, a VHF transistor which is quite cheaply available on eBay. In the collector circuit are three tuned circuits. The 144 MHz signal from the output of the doubler goes into an NE602 which is the product detector on receive and the balance modulator on transmit. On receive there's an RF preamp which uses an MPF 102. There's two tuned circuits here to provide some front end cell activity. The transistor you see here it's probably not clear it's just a microphone amplifier and that will be used for the transmitter stage only. And finally we have the receive audio a BC548 audio preamp and an LM386 audio amp. There's not a lot original about this and completed examples can be seen on the websites of VK3AJG and PY2OHH. To test the receiver we're using the VK3RGL beacon. It's around 60 kilometers away. The signal strength isn't all that strong because I'm receiving it on a vertically polarized antenna. Normally it would be much stronger. A great benefit of this beacon is I can tune the signal generator, which you see here, to an exact subharmonic of it, and hear the beat note in the FT817. That assures me of being exactly on frequency when I come to test the direct conversion receiver. One, two, three, one, two, three, talking through the FT817, hearing my own local signal on the direct conversion receiver. What I'll do now is have a poke around the circuit to demonstrate how construction technique can really influence performance. 
as it now stands, this very rough lash up is an example of what not to do, particularly for VHF. A good start has been made in some areas, for instance this box for the oscillator. Ideally it would have a lid to be properly shielded, but the other stages are open air and with long leads, which is just asking for trouble. I deliberately designed some physical separation here to lessen microphonics into the VXO. However, you still need to earth it electrically. Here's the difference that you get to the audio if I do that, in this case with this screwdriver. The extraneous hiss is cut out a lot. Another thing that's wrong is the audio connection. It's about 5 centimeters long, and bearing in mind we're dealing with very low level audio signals. The finger on the input and it picks up a strong AM broadcast station. Even probing around with some of the RF connections, you can hear that station. Another problem could be interaction between the frequency multiplier and the RF amplifier. And remember we're dealing with very low signals of a microvolt or less, so you do need good isolation. If we adjust the front end, the thing starts to oscillate. Again I'm not using very good earthing here, there's just one short connection on that part of the board and none anywhere else. It's almost like a regenerative receiver, but in this case we don't want that. Adjusting the frequency multipliers. So this is just to demonstrate the instability of RF circuits if they're unshielded, if there's unwanted coupling, or if you don't have enough bypassing from the DC rail to RF where needed. That's why you need to keep leads fairly short and provide shielding. Despite all the instability when twiddling the controls, when my hands are out of it, it seems reasonably stable. That's when driving headphones, which I'm holding up to the camera. What if I wanted to speak a reception? All right, so I'm just plugging in the speaker beside the radio. That demo shows that if you change the load presented to the output of the audio amplifier, under some circumstances, you can get oscillations. That may be one of the reasons why some receiver circuits aren't all that reproducible. One builder might have them operating fine on the headphones, but in this case, another builder using a speaker might have the receiver behaving badly. Maybe shorter leads in the audio stage may help. Another thing about this circuit is I didn't have a volume control. I had that bridged just for testing. If you're using an LM386 based circuit and you're not using a volume control, then there's a risk of oscillations, especially if you're using a lower impedance load like a speaker. So that's a quick look at my first ever direct conversion receiver for two meters. It's by no means complete and there's a lot of stability issues. However, performance is promising and better construction would mean that it should be quite a good performer.